This particular video is being made from a PowerPoint presentation that is built out of one that I normally use in class. I'll probably use it in class again this semester, but I plan to go through this part, this part of it, a little bit faster and focus on some other things that I like to show on the smart board. The reason for this video and the reason for spending some time on it in class is that typical ballistic pendulum problems are presented in such a way that the picture that is associated with the problem doesn't really show what's going on until you've perhaps done an experiment in the lab or looked at a whole bunch of these. So the interpretation step actually begins before it normally would in our problems in that you have to understand the picture you're given, what physical situation it's describing, and then draw a time sequence of what's actually taking place. I like to describe this kind of time sequence as a cartoon because it looks like a typical newspaper three-panel cartoon. At that point, you can then do the usual physical interpretation, interpret each part of what happened in this particular process. Usually more than one thing happens during a particular problem we're trying to solve. Then develop the equations, proceed to evaluate and assess the answer. The example I'm going to use is straight out of the textbook. It's a standard classic problem. It's what we'll do in the lab this week. It's also uh, something you'll see in various examples in your homework. I'd recommend that you turn to page 145 in your textbook to look at example 9.9. .9. In fact, you might want to pause this video right now, go pull up that page and take a look at it so you can see what the author says about it while I'm showing you these videos. Here's the picture. There's something like this for several of our problems in the homework in Lon Kappa, in our online homework. There also appears something like this in our lab manual for the problem we're going to do in the lab. The lab manual is a little bit better in that it has a combination drawing of only part of the problem, which makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. But nonetheless, this is a typical situation where several different things are shown at the same time in the picture. So what does this really mean? Well, with the magic of Photoshop, I've produced an animated version of this graphic without really changing any of its content at all. At the beginning, we have a bullet approaching a block. The block is hanging freely in space from the ceiling there, so it's constrained like a pendulum. The bullet is coming in with some mass and velocity. It collides with the block. Notice the block doesn't move. In this idealized situation, the block does not move. The bullet buries itself in the block. There's a new velocity in the problem, but the block hasn't been displaced at all. So we have a collision that takes place like that. Then, from that point, the block swings up and stops, reaching some maximum height h. So there's a second part to the problem where this block swings up like that. That's what's being shown in the combined picture, which sort of omits the middle part. That's where our lab manual is a little bit better in that it shows the middle part, but it's still sort of combined with the with the last part, so you don't see the full time sequence. Now we've got the pieces we need to do the physical interpretation of what happens. There are actually two steps that take place between the three pictures I've shown. The bullet is coming in, it's got some momentum, and it has some energy, right? It's got mv, and it's got one of mv squared. The block is at rest, it has zero momentum and zero kinetic energy. A collision takes place. That's a collision. It conserves momentum, but it does not conserve energy. In general, you should never assume that a collision conserves energy unless you're told that it does. In problems that I tend to give on exams and in the homework, uh, you simply cannot assume it conserves energy because they almost never do. If I want you to find out, I'll ask you to calculate the change in energy and see whether it conserved energy or not. So there's a collision. It conserves momentum. Then in the next phase, right, so you see you know, collision, conserves momentum. Then in the next phase, as it swings up, we're conserving energy, but not momentum, because now there's an external force being applied to it, gravity. We can conserve energy because we can treat gravity as potential energy, but it doesn't conserve momentum because there is an external impulse due to that force of gravity acting on the block for some period of time while it swings up. So in the second phase, it conserves energy. You cannot conserve energy from the beginning to the end. It's only conserved in the second half of the problem. And you can't conserve momentum from the beginning to end. It's only conserved in the first half of the problem. Understanding this is critical to being able to do these kinds of problems. OK, so what's the solution look like? This is one of mine. It's actually a pretty crude drawing of a problem, uh, the standard problem I've just shown you. 
uh, from my notes. I've sketched it really only for my own use because when I draw it on the board, I may or may not draw it as nicely as this. Might be, might be worse, might be better. Three panel cartoon that captures those three states. The state when the bullet is coming in with, with a velocity V and the block is hanging at rest. A state that is immediately after the collision when they have been merged together into a single object now moving with a new velocity V2 for the velocity in panel two. And then a third picture that shows it swinging up and at rest where it's now got a velocity V3. And in fact, you can tie various variables to panels one, two, and three. What is Y1, what is Y2, what is Y3 as part of setting up the variables that describe this situation. But the important thing right at this point is at the interpretation level is that between cartoon panel one and two, we conserve momentum because there's a collision. Between panels two and three, we conserve energy because it's a freely swinging pendulum. Then we can develop it, write down the equations. Initial momentum equals final momentum. In the middle block, initial kinetic energy equals final potential energy. These sort of written a little bit backwards because normally we write final equals initial plus the work, but or final equals initial plus the uh, impulse that we've applied to it in the collision, but here we're looking at a multi-body system. We can just leave out the details that we already figured out how to do in other kinds of problems. So we have mv1 plus zero equals the total mass times the velocity from momentum, and we have the initial kinetic energy when we have m total mass velocity squared equals total mass gh. And then we can solve those. This is a different problem. It would be described as the bullet going through the block where it has a different velocity after it leaves the block than when it hit the block. It's a homework problem that you'll see when you go on and do the homework for these uh, parts of the course, part of the course. What you notice is that one step is the same and another step is different. Here's the bullet coming in. It goes through the block. So the conservation momentum problem is different in that the bullet has got a final velocity in fact, there's two bodies in the final state, the bullet's mass times its velocity, the block's mass times its velocity. As long as we have enough knowns, we can solve for the one unknown, say the mass of the block, and then go on to the next part of the problem, which it turns out is the same. That's just the block is moving at some velocity and swings up to some height h. Okay. You can probably begin to imagine that there's lots of different ways to combine these things where the first part of the problem with the collision could be a different kind of collision. The ball could knock, bounce off, it could get caught, it can go through. It could be an elastic collision, it could be an inelastic collision of various sorts. And the second part could be different. It could be that the block is not attached to anything and it just flies through the air. It could slide across the ground. There's many different situations you could have in the final state because all you've got is a block that's got some velocity and it can do any of the things that we've already done through the, from the very beginning of the course until now. But the procedure is the same. Interpret and develop, where the interpretation requires sorting out each of the pieces of the problem. And so I'll end as usual with a credit to the textbook that I use.